Good morning. It is so great to be here with you all this morning. And for those of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name's Hollis, one of the pastors on staff here at Grace Place. And it's great to be able to bring, a privilege to be able to bring teaching from God's word. And so like Kim was saying, so we're in the seventh message in a series on season one of The Chosen. And today we're gonna dive a little bit also into the first part of season eight as well. And so I've entitled the message this morning, Follow Me. Follow Me is the title of the message this morning. And if you wanna follow along in your Bible, we're just gonna remain in one passage of scripture this morning. We're gonna be in Matthew chapter nine, uh, verses nine through 13. And we're gonna be looking at the radical call of Jesus and the transformational impact it has on those who respond to it. And so to, just to kind of set this up a little bit, as we've been going through The Chosen, if you've been watching it, um, or a couple weeks ago we, we watched a couple, episodes, or a couple scenes where we saw Matthew, and Matthew is a tax collector. So Matthew in that, um, in that time, well probably in this time too, you're not really popular as a tax collector. <laughs> but he was hated. So he was despised by other Jews. He was even disowned from his family. And so, so he's really an outsider. He's an outcast. And, and Matthew, as they depict in The Chosen, and likely in real life, had heard of and probably witnessed, possibly witnessed some of the miracles that Jesus was doing. And so here we have Matthew who's living this life of wealth and security, yet his world is being turned upside down by this teacher, by this man, Jesus. And so Jesus should turn our world upside down, changing everything that we thought we knew. Jesus turns our world upside down. Watch this. But we still have a roof over our heads, which is more than some people can say. You can ask me for money if you ever need it. How can you say that? It's quite common. I've seen many parents entirely dependent on your you. Your father would sooner die than take your blood money. I know you are ashamed of me, but your decision is irrational. Rome will continue to collect taxes no matter what. I'm skilled with numbers. Did you come here to justify yourself? No! no. Everything is like sand in a flood. The things I thought I knew to be true. Are you in trouble? Do you think that impossible things can happen? That overturn the laws of nature? That cannot be explained? That is what people asked when you were a boy. Even the rabbis were astonished at your talent for reading, math, the way you could think faster than any other child. They thought you would be someone great. Great at what? I'm rich. I have an armed escort. I'm trusted by the Praetor of we Galilee. We never dreamed you would use the talent God gave you to bleed your people dry. But have you ever seen anything miraculous? Matthew. My whole world. Everything I thought I knew. What if it's wrong? such a powerful scene, we see a man who has great talent, right? And many of us, many of you, I suspect have great talents that you rest and rely on. And he begins to have this encounter with Jesus. He begins to see Jesus, and all of a sudden, his life begins to be turned upside down. And I love how he use, uses there that it's unstable like sand in a flood. And when I think about that, I think about the times that I've been to the ocean and as you watch the ocean tide come in and how it moves the sand and you can put a seashell there and then that will disappear and dissipate and go away. It's it, everything, all his comfort, all of his security, everything that he has rested on and trusted on in himself becomes unstable, like sand in a flood. And when we have an encounter with Jesus, when we truly press in to get to know who Jesus is, it should change our understanding of the world. It should cause us to question our understanding of the world, the world as we've experienced it, the world as we've gone through our life, as we've known it. When we have an encounter with Jesus, 
he should cause us to question everything, right? Matthew says there, everything I thought I knew, what if it's wrong? I wonder how many of you live in that question. How many of you silently live in that question every single day, but haven't taken that next step into relationship with Jesus, taken that question actually to Jesus? So Jesus challenges us to reconsider our values and our priorities and the very foundation of our lives. See, many of us have, it's like building a house on sand. Many of us have built our lives on a foundation, our foundation on sand, and it's unstable, and it will wash away. And there's only one that we can build our foundation on, and that is Jesus. And that is Jesus. And you are invited. I am invited. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. See, each of us, each and every one of you is invited to follow Jesus. It's a personal invitation. No matter what you have done, no matter what you are doing now, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what has been spoken over you, there's an invitation. And Jesus is inviting you to come to him. And he invites you personally. It's not a distant, kind of broad invitation. He's inviting you right now, just like this. I went to see my mother. That would put me out too. She asked when you're going to give her grandchildren. She didn't ask. I thought your parents don't speak to you. I had questions I couldn't ask anyone else. A mother of a son with talent like yours should be proud. She's ashamed that I could use the talent that God gave me against God. Next. You're good at something. You found a way to make a living doing it. It's that simple. Must be nice to live in a world so simply ordered. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. I can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. 
Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Oh, I love that part. You're the host. <laughs> uh, so Jesus' call on Matthew is direct and it's personal. Just like for each of you, it's direct and it's personal. Follow me. And I love the different responses that you see depicted there in that scene. You know, Matthew, he goes through this disbelief. Me? I mean, Matthew knows what he is. Matthew knows that he's despised. Matthew knows that he's been disowned by his parents and by his community. Matthew knows what others think of him, and it's this disbelief. Me? Really, could it be? Could, could it be that somebody would really see me for me and invite me, and invite me into relationship with him? And there's this confusion, right? And I'm sure many of you have experienced this confusion as you've pursued a relationship with Jesus. And, and if you haven't, you're likely sitting in that confusion now. This confusion of, could, it, could this really be real? Could it really be true? Could it really be true that a holy God would really invite me into a relationship with him? Because I know what I've done. I, I, I know what I believe about myself, and yet, God sees something different, and he's inviting you, inviting you into this profound, life-changing relationship. And there's this profound sense of invitation, this excitement and anticipation. Could it really be? Could it be, really be real this time? I don't know how many of you have been invited into a relationship or into a relationship with somebody where you put your hopes and your dreams in that, and you thought it was going to be something, and it turned out it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. It wasn't everything that you had hoped it was going to be, and it led to sorrow and sadness. Some of you have experienced abuse and other things at the hands of other people, and put your trust in places, hoping, just hoping that this one time you would be accepted. Hoping, just hoping that this one time you would be loved and adored and it turned out it wasn't. And you began to live a life believing that you weren't worthy or worth it. But Jesus says that you are. Jesus says that you are, and the invitation is open. And we have this moment, we have this moment of decision. We see it there with Matthew, but each of you has a moment of decision to leave everything behind and follow Jesus. And that's a scary moment, frankly. That's a scary moment to, to put your trust, to put your faith, to put your hope, to set everything aside, every experience that you've ever had, every heartache, every loss, to put all wholeheartedly into a relationship with Jesus, into following him. But it is a moment. And can you remember when that moment was? The moment that you made the choice to leave everything behind and to follow him. It, as I, I went through this, it reminded me of one of many stories that God has done in my life of asking me to lay stuff down to follow him. Um, if you were here a couple weeks ago, I talked about the story where I used to be in construction, 2008, the market crashed, we lost everything, and I ended up going to work in the cafe, the church cafe. Um, making less than I'd ever made in my entire life, but being the most fulfilled because really my passion and my desire is food. I love to cook. I do. I, you probably can't tell. <laughs> but I love to cook because one, I love the creative aspect of it, but it is a way for me to show my love to people. It's this tangible way and I get such deep satisfaction out of cooking and, and, and providing a meal to people and watching them be satisfied. Um, and I get so many opportunities to witness through it, but um, as I worked in the cafe, God had called me into ministry to men, um, which is how I know God has a sense of humor because if you know my story, I grew up with alcoholic abusive father, so I didn't trust men at all um, and wanted nothing to do with them, no relationship. But God had been drawing me into 
leading a ministry to men. And as I stepped into that and I was working in the cafe and the cafe was like my pulpit. Literally, I would stand at the register, I'd have a line to the door and I'd pray with people. And it was just this really beautiful season in my life. And at one point, God said to me, and when I say God said to me, I don't hear this audible voice, but it's something deep, deep in me, and I know it's God. And a lot of my journaling and that kind of stuff is where I hear, begin to hear God and through scripture. And I hear, heard God say to me, I want you to quit the cafe. And I was like, what? Why would you give me my deepest desires and ask me to leave that? And, and uh, I got to support my family. And, and I heard God ask me this question. He said, do you trust me? And I said, absolutely, I trust you. And he said to me, do you trust me to take care of your wife and kids even when you can't? And I'd honestly say, no, no, I don't. Because, because if I don't take care of them, who is? And so God says, do you trust me then? I'm like, well, okay. So I, I'd submitted to that and then quit the cafe. I went in and said, hey, I feel like God's calling me to quit. Um, and so I've got to quit doing this. And it was really a, it was difficult and challenging. One of the hardest things actually that I've ever had to do was have that conversation and leave something that I loved. But this season was a season of God and his provision and teaching me more and more about his love for me. More and more that he is a provider. Now, I didn't have everything that I wanted, but I had everything that I needed. And I have so many stories of ways that God showed up and, and showed up J-I-T, just in time, right? And, and provided what I needed, not necessarily, like I said again, what I wanted, but showed up and for what I needed. And it, it cost me a lot to do that. And a lot of people, as I engaged in conversation with them and had conversation with them, spiritual mentors and friends, they're like, dude, what are you thinking? This is stupid. Why would you do that? Right? They, they were like incredulous. So why would you give up working and not support your wife and kids? Particularly at this season, I was teaching men about how you be a provider and you know work and provide for your wife and kids. That was really t challenging. Uh, um, but God was so good in that. And, you know, the, the response of most of the people was just like, dude, you've done lost your, your mind. And there are some who flat out don't like our choice to follow Jesus like this. I see you are wrong. I assume that means you found a replacement to watch our little friend. Uh, a new soldier has been trained and installed. Good. And I am reviewing applications for a new public honest for that district. What district? The collection district previously assessed by Matthew. Why are you doing that? Matthew left. He quit, Dominus. What do you mean, he quit? Why would you let him quit? He is a contractor. I, I had no recourse. Quit to do what? He is to become a student. Of what? Don't make me keep asking questions, Premier. He used to study the Jewish God. He left to follow a holy man, the man from the Eastern Ghetto. That, that is all I know. Oh, I really don't like that man. <laughs> See, some people are gonna have that response when we accept the call to follow Jesus. When we accept Jesus' invitation to follow him, there are things that don't make sense. There are places that you might be in where you're providing high value from an earthly standpoint, where you might be making tons of money, you might have lots of security, but God's call on your life, Jesus' invitation for you to follow him is going to cost. And not only does it usually cost you, but it might cost other people. And the other people's response a lot of times it might look like that. Oh, I really don't like that man. I really don't like Jesus. See, there's a lot of people who are uncomfortable with Jesus. There's a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the call that he puts on other people's lives. And they're really uncomfortable when people will risk to follow him. See, Jesus invites each of us personally, regardless of our past, to follow him and to follow him wholeheartedly. And there's many here in this room who Jesus is presenting the invitation to today, many who are hearing my voice who Jesus is presenting the invitation to today, 
to follow me, to follow me. And yes, it is that good. And yes, it is true. And yes, there is room at the table. And there's room at the table for you. Matthew 9, 10 through 13. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciple, disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. There is a table prepared, and there is a seat for you, and it's a joyful and beautiful table. Check this out. <laughs> the way he ran from the red quarter, nearly tripping on his robes. <laughs> a fairy say running? <laughs> Somehow I can't see that. Oh. Shut up! <laughs> I, can't see that. <laughs> I thought for certain he would trip and fall and I would be arrested. Knowing your luck, Rivka, probably would happen, huh? Oh. <laughs> I thought for certain. Lil was gone forever that day. It's Mary now. <laughs> Always was. <laughs> Does anyone want any grapes? Barnaby, you eat a lot. <laughs> Very absurd. Thank you. <laughs> Simon? You know, Matthew, when you're not behind iron bars, you're quite handsome. I agree. Ah. <laughs> what is going on? Hmm. May I help you? We were just on a walk and we heard voices, and I thought it sounded like. But surely not. And yet it is you. Would you like to come in? We would never. Never be caught dead in a. In a what? In a tax collector's house? Not only that. But we say, do you know what she and he, they are... You seem to be having troubles finding your words, man. Why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I must say, I am shocked. She is from the Red Quarter. Much of what is done there cannot even be spoken by my tongue or across my lips. It is so unholy. The mere mention of it would defile me. Sounds like a personal problem. But him and the others he works with, they betray our people for money, and they're not even sorry. If you're so offended, then leave. Let them speak, Andrew. They've never offered guilt sacrifices in the temple. What? The priest keeps the records. We check them. Tax collectors are not welcome at the temple. We would like them better if they made the proper sacrifices. This is not about me. This is about what God wants. You are forgetting the scroll of Hosea. Hmm? Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy more than sacrifice. There are righteous men on the lookout for you. And they are weighing every word you say. Is that a threat? Please let them know this, Yusuf. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Is everything under control here? Uh, yes. We were just going on our way, Centurion. There's Primi Ordina to you. Primi Ordina. You all keep eating. I, I will talk to this man. Guys? You're making a mistake. You can walk away from this. I made my choice. Look at that room. Other than Rom and Jahaz, whom I know to be law-abiding tax collectors, everyone else in there, the dregs of Capernaum. Gaius, lower your voice. The bottom of the barrel. Germanic, correct? Isn't that what you told Quintus? Do not change the subject. Your people surrendered. 
I'm surrendering too. I'm surrendering too. I, I love the beginning of that scene and they're all sitting there, they're eating, they're laughing, and Jesus is sitting there eating and laughing with them. He's not sitting at some high seat. He's not like the resident holy man, right? But he's sitting there in relationship. The invitation is there to come to the table, to come and follow him. And that's the Jesus that you will experience. There's invitation into religion, and we see the religious people who come who can't even bring themselves to say the words prostitute because it would defile them who can't even bring themselves to say the words of what other sins are who are sitting at the table in the room, that they can't even come into the room. They can't even begin to fathom what it would be like to engage in relationship with those people, and so they're lost. How will they ever be found? How will they ever be found unless there's an invitation? an invitation to the table, an invitation to follow. And that's the invitation that is before each and every one of us today, to follow me, not me, but Jesus, to follow him. See, Jesus says that he came for the sick and each and every one of us has a sickness and it's sin. Each and every person in this room has sin in their life. Each and every person online and hearing my voice has sin in their life. We all stand on common ground, each and every one of us. And here's the thing, there's no hierarchy of sin. Sin is sin is sin. Sin, Bible word, it means missing the mark. If you shoot an arrow and you miss the target, that's a physical representation of it. That's what sin is. It doesn't, there's no score level of sin. It doesn't say, well, if you do this, then you're, you're better than this person. And we have a tendency to do that. And the religious really have a tendency to do that. Well, I, I'm not this, so I'm okay because of this guy, right? No, no, that is not the case. We are all on level ground, every single one of us. It doesn't matter whether you murdered someone this morning or lied to someone this morning. It's sin. It's missing the mark. Now, those carry a different weight in what the consequences of them are, particularly from a human standpoint. But when we submit, when we go to Jesus and we ask for his forgiveness, it's his perfect life. It's his blood that was spilled on the cross. That's what saves us. That's what reconciles us. And there's nothing that we have to do. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that can be done because it's been done by Jesus. See, Jesus lived a perfect life. There was no sin in him. He did not lie. He did not murder. He did not cheat. He did not steal. He did not have gluttony in his life. He did not have greed. He lived a perfect life. And then he had the religious who couldn't stand that, couldn't stand him, couldn't stand his teachings, couldn't bear to sit with that, or couldn't bear to sit with somebody who would actually sit with the sick, with the people who needed it most, with the hopeless. And they had him tortured, strung him up on a cross where he died on that cross. At the end, at the end just before his death, he said, to tell us thy. It is finished. It's a word that's used in accounting, which means the debt has been paid. Paid in full, completely erased. So the debt of your sin, the sin that's in your life, that debt is completely eradicated because of his perfect life and his spilt blood on the cross. And we could say, yeah, that's a great story, Hollis. That, that's wonderful but we know that it's true. And how we know that it's true is because three days later, he rose from the tomb. And it wasn't just a couple people that saw him, but hundreds and hundreds of people who saw him alive after dying on the cross, which means he is who he said he was, the son of God, which means he could do what he came to do, the forgiveness of sin. 
How many of you need that forgiveness today? I know I do. I know I need it each and every day. And there's nothing that you have to do to get it because it's been done. To Telestai, it's finished. You go, Jesus, I submit and surrender to you. The life that I've built is on shifting sand. And I realize that and I submit to sur- and surrender to you as, as Lord and Savior, as King and ruler of my life. Yeah. See, not dime store Jesus, not Jesus as an insurance policy so that I have eternal life. No, but submitting and surrendering to Jesus now to be transformed from the inside out by his healing, by his restoration and by his hope. Yeah. See, we should look different. Yeah. There should be something different about us when we say we are a follower of Jesus, our life should become different. The way that we react and respond to people should be different. We should begin to, not overnight, grant you, some people that might happen to you, but they will know us by our love, how we love others. How do people know you? I'm curious. I know how people know me. And in some environments, people don't necessarily know me for my love. That doesn't make me thrilled. But I'm aware of it, and it's a continual process and a continuous process where Jesus continues to work on my heart, and the invitation is always there to come and to sit with him because he desires mercy, not sacrifice. See, The kingdom of God is open to all, especially those who are considered outsiders. And change isn't change unless something changes. Change isn't change unless something changes. See, he invites us to follow him. And many of us have said yes to Jesus. And many of us are still in the tax collector's booth. Many of us have said, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. And maybe we're still in this place of insecurity or disbelief or or something that's keeping us in the tax collector's booth. And we haven't stepped out. We haven't set whatever it is that's holding us back aside and follow Jesus. And I love that Matthew after his encounter with Jesus, choose, chooses to believe and to give everything to follow him. What's wrong? What happened? What did it mean? Follow me. That is all he said. Matthew did not hesitate. Follow him where? Look, I'm sure he will come to his senses. <laughs> his senses. Do you know my son? Do you? At the moment, he believes this man to be a prophet. The man that healed the paralytic at Zebedee's house. I would be careful with that word, healed. We do not know what sort of trickery or illusion may have been involved. Matthew has no interest in illusion. Nor in your God. Or so I thought. Matthew upended his life to be with him. His wicked life. He does not make decisions lightly. That is true. When I saw him two days ago, he did not seem himself. But I never would have guessed that he was preparing for this. He asked me to deliver to you some of his personal effects. With an eye in heaven. The key to his house. Luxury bought off the backs of our people. I will not accept it. He suspected as much. Sell it. Give it away. Burn it down. I do not care. Don't burn it down. (laughs) See, true change requires transformation of our heart and everything that we do flows from it, our actions. It's not just external rituals, right? So true change is not just coming to church, important to hang out with other believers, to be built up, It's not just going to a small group, important, yes, 
spending time with other believers, pursuing a relationship with Jesus, getting built up. But change isn't change unless something changes. And there should be a radical shift in our hearts that leads into our everyday actions. That there's a saying that says, actions speak louder than words. Many people will say, I'm a believer, and the only way that I would know that they are a follower of Jesus is because they told me. But what I experience of them, what I know of them, what I see in their actions, their choices and decisions that they make day in and day out, they are not a follower of Jesus. They are not being transformed by him. I, I, I encounter many people who say that they believe in Jesus, but they don't spend time with him. So how do you become like your teacher? How do you begin to be transformed if you're not spending time hanging out in the presence of Jesus? See, true transformation in Matthew's life is evidenced in his decision to follow Jesus. That there's a physical representation of it, but there's also a, an inward representation of it. And then how he begins to interact with other people as we'll see as we go through the rest of this series and if you watch the rest of The Chosen. See, genuine faith is demonstrated through changed lives and having a heart of love. Genuine faith is demonstrated through changed lives and having a heart of love and loving others. And so I wanna invite you this week to reflect, where is Jesus calling you to surrender and to change? What is it in Jesus inviting you to lay down at the foot of the cross? Are you ready to follow him? What's holding you back? Are you afraid of the words, the things that people might say? What is holding you back from wholeheartedly following Jesus? And if he's calling you someplace, would you be willing to leave everything behind? Would you be willing to risk the logical, all the security that you have, all the things that you've built your life on, shifting sand, to have that washed away and be standing on a firm foundation, on the rock of Jesus? I wanna invite you guys to stand with me as I close in prayer. And the reason I'm inviting you to stand is because when we follow, we can't do it sitting down. When we make a choice and a decision to follow Jesus, it requires action on our part. It requires a choice. It requires a decision. And so I'm inviting you today, so Father, we come before you, grateful God that you are a good father and that you are a father who pursues us. And so Jesus, my prayer continues to be, has been and continues to be that right now, that every person hearing my voice would more importantly hear yours. Would more importantly hear yours saying, follow me. Follow me. And that they would see the love in your eyes, the welcoming of who you are, and the open arms of embrace to invite them into your kingdom. Holy Spirit, give us the courage to wholeheartedly follow Jesus and to embrace the transformation that he brings into our lives. And there's somebody that's hearing my voice right now who has not yet said to yes to Jesus, but you might be feeling that prompting right now. Tom, follow me. And so if that's you right now, it's just as simple as saying, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I submit to you as king, as Lord and ruler of my life. And I choose to follow you. And it's that simple, and so we just take action to follow him. And so God, your word says that your word is a lamp to our feet, so may it be a lamp that leads, that directs, and guides our life. 
and your way is the only way. We know that there's a narrow road. So wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And so Jesus, we choose the narrow way and we wanna be on it because we know God that you are good, your promises are good, and we will take you at your word. Amen.